lovely that you come, and I don't know how much you know about the Brahma Kumaris or how you found out about this event, um, but a uh, little bit about us uh, might set the context for this evening as well. So first and foremost, we are a spiritual organization, so that's going to be a big focus tonight. Um, but more than that, we're actually in the business of happiness. So I don't know if that's of interest to you. But that's our, uh, most people are not interested in sorrow. So <laughs> if you are, you might be in the wrong place. Um, our focus is a lot on peace and happiness uh, with a deep belief that that is an internal responsibility, that those are not really reactions, but actually natural states of being that we've gotten a little disconnected from. So we engage in a practice called Raj Yoga, and the entire focus of Raj Yoga, which is a spiritual study, is to restore, to re-emerge our natural capacities inside for peace and happiness. So that's it in a nutshell. There's some beautiful websites that you can visit for all the details, but that's it in a nutshell. Um, before we look a little bit deeper at what tonight's all about, I'm going to ask you, and this might involve standing and dancing around, I don't know, but I'm going to ask you to um, get a conversational partner, which means you have to pair up with someone, in case you're wondering what that means. Ideally, someone who speaks the same language as you do, um, and perhaps someone that you don't know. So if I have you in a minute or two, just take that time to partner up with someone. Go ahead. And if you don't have a partner, put your hand up. Make a friend. No one here, as far as I know, bites. So I think you're going to be okay. Make a friend. If you do not have a conversational partner, or if you have a conversational partner who doesn't really speak your language, <laughs> let us know. Does anyone not have a partner? So I don't know. I feel that with her and Upadesh look like they're... Um, does, does everyone have a partner? I know it sounds strange, but if you don't have a partner, can you raise your hand? Everyone has a partner. Or else you don't speak English and you have no idea what I'm talking about. Because tonight, <clears throat> um, there might be questions posed at certain moments. And you might be invited to discuss with your conversational partner what that question means to you. So it may not be such a passive experience tonight. So this evening is inspired really by all festivals of light. Um, we put forward uh, Diwali, which is a Hindu festival, but we've entered the season of festivals of lights. And for those who were enjoying the visual presentation during meditation, I think we all are aware that we have a special relationship with light. We love to see lights. It does something for us. We're not quite sure why or what, but it does something for us. And all these festivals seem to come when we're entering the darkest times of the year, so the lights seem particularly bright. Um, Diwali is a Hindu festival, and like many of the festivals, the lights are very rich, actually, with um, a lot of different aspects. So in some parts of India, it's the New Year, so the idea of newness is quite a significant part of that festival. Uh, new clothing, new accounts, new year, Cleanliness, newness, newness, newness. And prosperity and abundance is another part. So this is one of the rare uh, programs where we actually use colored cloths on the table <laughs> as opposed to white ones because it's a time of such festivity and abundance and wonder. The invocation of Goddess Lakshmi, the Goddess of God. And sweets and joy and fun happiness, just like all the festivals of lights. But 
And, you know, very often, I don't know if anyone has gone to a Diwali celebration, but it's quite powerful and wonderful. And then we kind of go to business as usual. Right? That's kind of our relationships with festivals, isn't it? We have a wonderful moment, and then we're back to work. Right? The exception might be Halloween, where we're back to work with a lot of chocolate, but we're just basically back to business as usual. And so the hope tonight is by having conversations and reflections, maybe there might be a little bit more that you take away from the program because the intention of these different festivals wasn't a moment of entertainment or diversion or distraction, but actually transformation. So that you go into the festival and come out with a different, really different feeling in life. So seeing if we can get a little closer to the intention of those festivals and what they represent. Sunlight. First opportunity to connect with your conversational partner. Um, when you hear the term light, or when you see a light, what kinds of ideas come to mind? What does light mean to you? The theme tonight is igniting the heart of lightness. So we're going to explore lightness and really try and get to the very essence of, and, or core of what it means. So when you hear light or see light, what does that mean to you? Various aspects to that. So take a moment with your conversational partner to kind of unpack this idea of light between the two of you. Um, does anyone want to share what ideas were coming up about light? You can probably guess. I'm hoping you'll do my job for me. So um, yes, go ahead. So an, and it gives us an energy of positivity, light. Or when we see a light, it gives us a positive energy. Yeah. Anything else? Happiness. Light, happiness, joy, happiness. So it's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. I used to do something very not nice to my older sister. <laughs> I tend to wake up very early and she slept very late, so when I wanted to play mate, I would turn on the light while she's sleeping and she was not very happy with me. But yes, it's, it tends to wake people up when they're in the dark and you turn on the light. Anything else about light? Illumination. Illumination. In a broader sense. In a broader sense, yeah. So she lights a candle before she meditates in the morning and it has a symbolic significance for you. Is it a universal connection that means no words? Right. You don't have to speak the same language to go loud. Mm, right, so it really has a universal appeal or understanding, doesn't it? You don't need to speak the same language to really be affected by it. Absolutely. Sharing? Symbolizes sharing. Sorry. It signifies energy. Energy. Light on. They certainly use that on computers, don't they? For example, I think uh, Devang has something working at the back of the room, and a little light went on when it was turned on. And when we turn off, the light will go off. <laughs> so definitely, it means something is on. Anything else? A single source of light that creates a reflective or calming feeling. Right, so very unique time of light, which is the dawn, when you can, coming out of that darkness, right, it's quite stunning and beautiful and a quiet awakening almost. You can feel it in nature as well. Very nice. Well, we could really spend the whole evening going into any of these, how beautiful, but the bottom line is 
and is that universal appeal. It's quite a profound thing, light. You know, and biblically, the first thing God says is, let there be light. <laughs> so it seems pretty important <laughs> in terms of even priorities for God, right? Let there be light. So we're just going to maybe take a few of those topics because we have to be out of this hall at a certain hour, unfortunately. So can't go on and on and see if, again, together with your partner, your conversational new friend, um, you can also see what these mean for you as well in your day-to-day -day life. We talked about, in the theme, the idea of a heart of lightness. So this nature of lightness. Do you know what that feels like when you have a feeling of lightness inside? Do you know what that, have you had those moments of lightness? And do you know the opposite, moments of heaviness? And do you know what creates a feeling of lightness? And do you know what creates a feeling of heaviness? Is that clear to you? What creates lightness and what creates heaviness? Can you take a moment again to share with your conversational friend what creates lightness for you and what creates heaviness? Just a minute or two to share. What creates lightness? Let's start with what creates feelings of heaviness? Worry. That seemed to come quicker. Worry. All right. Um, what exactly are we worrying about? Tons of things out there. Is it your work or is it my work, my kids, my family? Yeah. My work, my kids, my family. Okay. The more you get it, the more you feel it. Yes. Sorry? The more you carry something, you know, any kind of load you are. Any load you feel heavy. So what? What's creating that? So I heard the word attachments come from over here. Feeling stuck. And you know, there's a wonderful saying that um, a bird can be super attached again to the branch, saying, "I can't fly. I can't fly," which of course it can, but it feels stuck because it won't let go and fly, right? It's built to fly, but it's very attached, right? So back to those attachments. Anything else that creates that heaviness? Insecurity, yeah. Insecurity. <laughs> Loneliness, did I hear? Loneliness? Loneliness, insecurity. Sorry? Pro focusing on problems. Attitude. So having certain attitudes create heaviness, fear. Comparison. We have a really long list. It's kind of disturbing. Comparison. Uh -huh. Back to the insecurity. <laughs> Comparing. All right. I, I know you're all speaking theoretically, right? You've never actually experienced this. You're just talking theoretically. I thought it was heavy. All right. So anything else that anyone needs to express on heaviness? I know, that's, you know, if they just, I was going to say, let's just really talk honestly. If people just behave and did what I wanted, my life would be so much lighter. Why won't you all behave? So not, people not doing what I want. Disappointment in people and things, situations, so. So expectations leads to disappointments. I expected something, I didn't get it, and so I'm disappointed. Disconnection. So, did you want to elaborate on that a little bit? When you feel misunderstood. Misunderstood. Or judged, or you judging. Right, right. Yeah, it's funny, I was talking to someone about communication the other day. There's a lot of that going on, right? But, uh, not understanding. All right, do we feel we have a fairly decent list? <laughs> a very heavy list of what creates happiness? One more. Meaninglessness. Now I'm really depressed. <laughs> All right, so on to brighter things. Um, please have an equally long list 
of what creates the feeling of lightness. Probably the opposite of the other. <laughs> what creates the feeling of lightness that you've experienced? Happiness. Happiness? Nature. How do I get that feeling? Nature. Nature, being in nature for some, yes. Acceptance. Acceptance. Contentment. Contentment. Kindness. Detachment. <laughs> Pretty much the opposite of the entire other list. Detachment. Let go. Let go, detaching. Temporality. Temporality? So, did you want to expand on that a little bit? I asked you. That's okay. Accepting that everything is a cycle, both bad and good things, and they're both necessary. All right, so that things keep changing, or that there's a temporariness to things, and okay, so that's deeply connected actually to detaching, mm -hmm. right? Which is very connected to the first thing you said about getting stuck, right? I'm hanging on to things, not like, appreciating that they are temporary, right? So that's that attaching. So I know that the term came up: illumination, the larger, larger picture. Do you think? that you are attached to darkness. She said with a frown on her face. <laughs> when you sleep. <laughs> so we're attached to sleep. <laughs> and we seem to sleep better in the dark, right? Yeah, yeah, when we sleep. <clears throat> So a big part of, yes, Sally, go ahead. I'm very attached to a nice guy, to which nice is a guy. balance of twinkling lights and darkness. Right. And neither would work without the other. Right. Yeah, I think so the twinkling star. So in that sense, star, I am rather attached to darkness. Because it highlights the light. Indeed. Right? So uh, I think we love the way it highlights the light. And it's the home, mm. the planet that we live on. So we have, we have both. Mm -hmm. So back to this idea that came up in the very beginning of that conversation on heaviness about the my work and my kids and my this and my that and connecting it. And it was very nice that it was brought up with the temporariness of things. Um, when we think about the things that we say my to, um, was there a time when they were not mine? And will there be a time when they're not mine? In other words, are they kind of temporary? They kind of come and go very naturally? It turns out that that's kind of how the physical realm works, is things are temporary, they come and go. And there's actually four Ps that define the planet, if you will, this temporary realm. And there's nothing wrong with them, they're rather wonderful, right? But they just come and go, right? That's just the natural way they work. The first P is package, this thing here, right? this body, this package. And it has different features to it. But I think we're all pretty aware that this package is temporary, right? Or do I need to try to convince you of that? <laughs> Perhaps, I don't know. Um, but it's temporary. It will come and it will go, and that's fine. And relative to this package are some other bits. For example, people or relationships, right? So because I'm in this package, I think of other people as mother, father, sister, brother, because I'm in this package. It's relative to being in this package, right? So, to, if I was to you know, use the group in this room, how many have a relation sitting here in the room with them? 
a brother, sister, mother, father, husband, whatever. How many have a relationship? You're very shy. <laughs> Raise your hand in the air. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. So, you know, just considering the feelings that you have towards that physical lineage, uh, relative, do you have equally the same feelings to everyone else in this room? Yes or no? No. No. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? I mean, we talk about brotherhood, but we don't really live it. Right? We're so deeply tied into that physical definition of relationship, right? that they physically have to be related to me. And that will define how I feel about them. And that's called conditional. There's conditions, aren't there? They have to be related to me. <laughs> that's the condition. I will feel a certain way towards them if they are related to me. And if they're not, or they aren't doing what I like, then I will feel differently, lots of conditions. So relationships, that's another one. Those come and go as well, right? Or as way nodding her head, because she knows that. They come and go. Another one is possessions. Do those come and go? Yeah, cars come and go. Phones come and go. Right? Probably have all sorts of different devices you've gone through. They come and go. And the biggie. Position, status, comes and goes, right? I'm employed in this company today, and I'm not employed in this company tomorrow. It comes and goes, right? I have a, an experience almost daily um, <coughs> working in the, in the fitness industry, and uh, we'll have a studio that looks just like this. It has a wood floor and mirror and it's all the deal. And if you were to look in the studio about five minutes before class starts, those who are, have gone to a fitness class will know this. If you look in the studio about five minutes before class starts, you're not really going to see any people standing in the studio, but what you will see is well-positioned water bottles on the floor. Do you know why? My spot. Everyone's marking my spot. And Lord help anyone who's new and walks into that landline. <laughs> uh, because my sense of value or status is connected to where I'm standing in that room. So everyone wants to make sure that they get my spot or my bike or whatever the case might be. We can very quickly um, get, even now, you've kind of marked your chair. Right, it's got my stuff around it, and I hope she doesn't tell me I have to stand up and move somewhere because I'm really comfortable in my chair. Right? We can attach to things extremely quickly, and it's completely temporary. Right? So there's a bit of allusion to this word, my, because it, it's never really actually my. Right, it comes and goes, and I very much enjoy it while it's around, and that's wonderful. But do I have that lightness or ease of letting it go, which inevitably it will? Right, it's through that easiness, that lightness of letting go. And rather even in the word detachment, just freedom. Do I have that freedom? to just let things come and let things go. The moment I uh, attach, I get, as he said, stuck because of this word mine, that's when it starts to get very heavy. And we actually start to operate less effectively, believe it or not. We have this kind of thing of going in the opposite direction of where we want to go. So the more I say mine, the less effective I will be in that situation. Right? How many believe that their natural nature is to be liked? Yeah, I deeply believe that. So I'm just showing up in any situation, liked, any 
situation. Light. Do you think that's possible? Any situation. I mean any. <laughs> Not selective, but any situation. Do you know what that means when I say any situation? Children are like every situation. Children are any. Right, yeah, we're selling them. You should really be more serious in this situation. This is a serious situation. You should be more serious. Stop playing around, right? And they're just kind of in that natural nature of light. And we're kind of educating them out of it, right? So being very light in every situation, because it is hard. But if there is that lightness, it disconnects me from that heart or true nature of lightness. So when we say illumination, there's kind of illusion on one side and illumination on the other side. Right? So this illusion of mine, which is shutting down my true nature of lightness, and then this illumination right, of what's really going on. Nothing is really mine. Almost nothing. Right? So the temporariness of the physical realm. And then there's something called the spiritual realm. Are you familiar with the spiritual realm? Right? We're so connected to the physical realm which is very temporary, to the point that we actually think we're physical. How many feel they're physical, that they're this body? Speaking honestly. I know, I've been working on it for about 25 years. <laughs> I'm still so congratulations to the rest of you. <laughs> um, this idea that we're this body. You know, someone used the example of a child that the garage did, and it's such a, a joy to watch a child because they, especially when they're very, very young, infants, they don't really seem fully connected with the body yet. You know, we kind of have to teach them how to use it. <laughs> they're not quite sure what's going on and what is this thing, right? So how do you walk it? How do you feed it? It's all kind of disconnected in a different way. Um, and then we kind of slowly get into this idea, I am the body. But we really developed quite a facility with the physical. Which is fine, because we're in a physical realm, so that's going to be useful. But have we disconnected with our understanding or illumination around the spiritual? Do you feel that you are a human doing? Or a human being. Which do you think you are? Are you a human? Do it depends on the day. Yeah, that's the honest answer. Depends on the moment, really. Um, how many feel they go through the day mostly as a human doing? And what does it mean to be a human being? Right, that's the beauty of spirituality. We say we're human beings. Right? And that's a two-part thing. There's the physical, humus, and then there's the being, supposedly me, non-physical. So spirituality looks at that which is not temporary. And somehow we're trying to make the physical, all the spiritual, we're trying to make the physical be not temporary. So back to Raj's comment about controlling people. Right? Controlling things, making them stay, stay in the way we want them to stay. <laughs> and they're going to change and do whatever. And the spiritual realm, looking at that which is not temporary, which is eternal. That which does not change. Right? Which is more constant. It might merge or emerge. But it's always there. So a very simple example. As you're sitting there right now, take two fingers. And see if you can find a heartbeat, a pulse. I hope you do. It's okay, nor is a nurse. And I do have my first aid. Are you successful? That's good. <laughs> 
So, do you feel that the heart was beating all the time you've been sitting here? Yes? Or did it just start beating when you went to feel for it? Was it beating all the time? Even when you weren't paying any attention. And we usually don't pay any attention to the heartbeat of the body. We go through days, weeks, whatever. Right? Paying no attention, not even thinking about the heartbeat. Is that correct? Is it still beating, even though we're not thinking about it? It's still there. Right? So this idea that even though I may not be reflecting or thinking about myself as a spiritual being, it doesn't mean that's not still what I am. <laughs> right? I'm just not paying any attention to that aspect of the self. Right? But it's still the case that I'm a spiritual being. And almost every course that we offer, every program we do, we eventually hope it comes down to that question of, in your heart, who do you think you are? Do you think that you are a being, a soul? Or do you think that you are the body, the humus? Whether or not you feel, experience it, what do you feel that you are? What do you believe that you are? A being, a soul, or the body? This package. Take a moment to talk about it with your conversational partner. Do you think you are a soul? Or do you think you are the body? So just to help you set up that conversation, the first option is, I am a body, and maybe I have a soul. The second object option is, I am a soul, and clearly I have a body. So those are your two options to discuss. A or B, go ahead. Into that, that paradigm of my relatives, my work, my stuff. I'm back into that box, if you will and trying to find different ways to experience lightness within that box. Right? So we try distractions and entertainment, all sorts of interesting things, to try and experience lightness within that box. Does that sound familiar? Because a huge part of that box is that my sense of self is out there in the physical. Right? I even think of the body as the physical. But my sense of self is out there in the physical. And so it's, it's quite true, Raj said, I'm, I'm constantly trying to control those four Ps so I can feel light. Because I'm really attracted for reasons we don't even bother to try and understand. It doesn't even matter. We're just really attracted to feeling light or free or happy. It seems like we're built that way. We don't even question. We're just really pulled to feel that way. Is that not the case? It's quite fascinating. And it is universal. Cross temporal, cross cultural, we want to feel light. We're really pulled. And yet we've got this paradigm that's making it increasingly difficult to feel that way. Are you finding that? Now we live in a part of the world where it's still quite good, actually. I mean, I think Calgary's rising to the top of the list in the world as places to live because it's remarkable how lovely it is. It still is here on a global when we're looking globally. And so we can still sort of make that paradigm work. Right? We can still make it work because, you know, we still have stuff, we're still able to get stuff, and we can still kind of work, although it's getting more difficult for people. And, you know, so we can sort of make that stuff. We have enough medical care that we can kind of keep this thing going. So we can kind of make that paradigm work. It's getting more difficult, is it not? It's getting more and more challenging. It's kind of like a game of dodgeball, I feel. <laughs> like more stuff is getting thrown out. But anyways, we can kind of make it work, but it's, it's getting tough. And it's putting a bit of strain. This idea of stress comes up. This paradigm is starting to show wear and tear. Right? These four Ps. And then there's this fifth P point, this other paradigm. 
that maybe I'm not all that stuff. I don't, I don't have to worry about controlling those four P's. I'm not that stuff. They're going to come and go anyways. Uh, maybe within me, and this is the stuff that does belong to me, what, what's within me, the P, the point, the being? What's within me? Stuff will come and go, but maybe there are capacities and treasures within me that will stay intact even as things are changing, those other four P's are changing. Does that make sense? My first exposure to what I later realized was spirituality. Some of you might be familiar with this, and many of you have already heard this, but it was an individual named Viktor Frankl, who was in a concentration camp. And so he really had no control over the four piece whatsoever, right? No control really, and the body was wasting away, the relations were going. <laughs> there was no status whatsoever. <laughs> And there was no possessions, really. The four Ps were gone. And within that context, internally, he was having this feeling, even then, I'm still responsible. I can still create quality of life. Even though those Ps are pretty much gone. I can still create quality of life. But it's going to be internal. Something's going to happen inside. I can't look outside for that lightness or quality of life. We all know this, theoretically. Do we not? <laughs> but we're having problems living it. We know it theoretically, but we don't necessarily live it. And do we have another P, the patience to shift over? Because it's going to be a bit of a journey to shift over into this other way of living. You know, that's what all these festivals really represent, is an invitation to shift paradigms, right? a celebration of a different way of living. And so this idea of, okay, if it's not about controlling the four Ps or getting my lightness and happiness from the four Ps, but actually, I have the capacity for lightness within me all the time. Do you think that's possible, again, in every situation? Do you believe in constant happiness? I believe it. Intellectually, theoretically. <laughs> I love honest people. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Theoretically, it sounds like it should work, right? But if I look at my life, you know, um, and in fact, we're in a part of the world where we have so much, so guess what? We're very disturbed by the smallest thing going wrong. Okay. Have you seen that? Very disturbed by the smallest thing. And then we wonder why we're not light. Why there's not this constant happiness. And then in other parts of the world where they seem to have almost nothing, right? they seem to have a better grasp on happiness and lightness. It's kind of embarrassing, actually. So, is there an internal capacity for lightness? And I love it when I see a candle, you know, because it's just this candle with a wick. I'm going, that candle has a capacity to be light. Does it not? I mean, it was built to be light. That's its nature, that's its purpose, that's its function, is to just be light. Yes? All it needs is a match, some source of light to illuminate it, and it's good to go, right? It's not that it suddenly turns into a candle, but it always is a candle, it always has that capacity. It just needs a source to light it, right? And it's good to go. Once it's lit, it doesn't even have a source anymore. It's just good to go. And it could be a source. And it could be a source for others, absolutely. We might experiment with that tonight, yeah? So once that candle's lit, it could be a source to light another candle. Great. So I have a capacity, as a soul, I have a capacity, intern an intrinsic capacity to be light. Doesn't matter what's going on out there. Doesn't matter what's happening with the four Bs. This body could be falling apart. 
And if I can access my intrinsic capacity to be light, I could stay light. Do you think that's possible? To stay light? Body's falling apart. Stay light? I lose my job. Stay light. Someone runs into my Maserati that's parked on the side. I stay light. Is that possible? Not only is it possible, we can go a step further and start to care about other beings more than we do stuff. Right? So if someone runs into my Maserati, I get angry at them rather than make sure they're okay. Because they're more important than my Maserati, are they not? The being is always more important than the stuff, right? Do we live that way? Honestly. Be honest. Do we really live that way? Does there ever come a point when stuff becomes more important than people? The temporary becomes more important than the eternal? If anyone works in business, they may have experienced how the bottom line becomes more important than people. Has anyone experienced that? It stresses us out a lot because it's against our intrinsic nature. So really starting to remember our intrinsic nature is to be very light and to value that which is eternal. Right? To really give that, really to protect the light of others. That's from our true nature. All we need to do, we have that capacity, so we just need to illuminate it or ignite it or you know, kind of emerge it once again. And we're going to need a light source to do that. Right? We often try and go to others to do it. But guess what? We're all in the same boat. Nobody's lit. <laughs> so, we can experiment with it right now. <laughs> if I take one unlit candle and hold it to another unlit candle, what's going to happen? Nothing. But we do that, we do, and this is why we go kind of mad, is because we have that expectation, and someone said disappointment, we have that expectation. This is supposed to make me light. This is supposed to make me happy. I am very disappointed it's not happening. But I'm kind of going in there like a crazy person, expecting something that could never happen. Because it's not lit, or they're not lit either. Right? We're all kind of roaming around looking for that light source. And so, <clears throat> when we look at spirituality, we can start to connect with that intrinsic capacity to be light, and maybe even start to remember a source of light. And we kind of have a vague memory, but it's gotten a little twisted and distorted over time, like a bad game of telephone. Have you ever played that game? Where you have a message and you whisper it and you whisper it, and without, every time I've played it, it always has the same result. The message at the beginning and the message at the end is like, what happened? What happens? I never quite understand. It should be fairly straightforward. I take a message and I whisper it. What happens? Why is it always distorted as it comes up the other side? Does anyone know? Perceptions? Perceptions, yeah. There's all these biases in between. Right? Our capacity to listen, to communicate, to understand is quite compromised. Right? So we kind of fill in gaps and do all sorts of other things as that. Message and so we've done that. And so this memory we have, a source of light, has gotten extremely mixed up and twisted as it's gone through human communication. Not just human, but human doing communication, right? Very physical communication. And so, how can I reconnect to that very pure understanding of the source of light, which, yes, we know of as God, the divine, or the supreme? There's a memory in each of us that's quite pure of that soul. It's got a lot of other weird, distorted ideas around it. And I remember in the Gita now, where Arjuna, you know, he was working on his ability to contemplate, to focus. And we always talk about the candle in the windless place. Have you heard that saying? A candle in a windless place. 
And what helps us a great deal to reconnect in a very clean and clear way with those memories is silence. Silence. I appreciate what was said about dawn, the beginning of the day. That is the most silent time of the day. I think you describe it almost as a quiet joy. It's not dead. Silence is not dead. It's wonderful, but it's silent. It's quiet. It's very clean. It's very pure. There's not all that busyness and waste and noise going on. It's just the sound of those eternal memories. Silence. So if I want to connect with that source of light again, I'm going to have to develop a very powerful, enjoyable relationship with silence. Candle doesn't like a lot of wind. It doesn't go well. Right? It likes a windless place, silence. So if you're open, I thought we could at this time go through a little bit of a meditation and then our concluding experience as well with the candles behind me to see if we can establish, re-establish ourselves, each of us in that state of being in a candle, going into that silence and starting patiently to awaken that memory we each have of the source. Is that okay? A little contemplation. So it's going to require a little setup if we can be patient <laughs> because we are going to have this commentary, this reflection, this remembering. And afterwards, we're going to invite each of you one at a time to, yes, celebrate, I suppose, but more remember through some symbolism. So there is these candles behind us. I think Diane's going to write the big white one, <laughs> and she'll be there with you. And invite each of you, in that state of awareness of being a candle, to light a candle, but more as a mirror of who you are. So try not to get too caught up in the act of lighting the candle, more staying inside, connected to the experience of being alive, and just representing that externally through the light of a candle. And after that, coming around, watch you record, and we'll have for you here um, blessings and tolling as well, which you can take from here. So just a moment to set that up. If you can wait one or two minutes. Into that, that paradigm of my relatives, my work, myself. And back into that box, if you will, and trying to find different ways to experience lightness within that box. Right? So we try distractions and entertainment, all sorts of interesting things, to try and experience lightness within that box. Does that sound familiar? Because yeah. a huge part of that box is that my sense of self is out there in the physical. Right? I even think of the body as the physical. But my sense of self is out there in the physical. And so it's, it's quite true, Ravash said. I'm, I'm constantly trying to control those four Ps so I can feel light. Because I'm really attracted for reasons we don't even bother to try and understand. It doesn't even matter. We're just really attracted to feeling light or free or happy. It seems like we're built that way. We don't even question. We're just really pulled to feel that way. Is that not the case? It's quite fascinating. And it is universal. Cross temporal, cross cultural, we want to feel light. We're really pulled. And yet we've got this paradigm that's making it increasingly difficult to feel that way. Are you finding that? Now we live in a part of the world where it's still quite good, actually. I mean, I think Calgary's rising to the top of the list in the world as places to live because it's remarkable how lovely it is. It still is here on a global, when we're looking globally. And so we can still sort of make that paradigm work, right? We can still make it work because, you know, we still have stuff, we're still able to get stuff, and we can still kind of work, although it's getting more difficult for people, and 
you know, so we can sort of make that stuff. We have enough medical care that we can kind of keep this thing going. So we can kind of make that paradigm work. It's getting more difficult, is it not? It's getting more and more challenging. It's kind of like a game of dodgeball, I feel. <laughs> like more stuff is getting thrown out. But anyways, we can kind of make it work, but it's, it's getting tough. And it's putting a bit of strain. This idea of stress comes up. This paradigm is starting to show wear and tear. these four P's. And then there's this fifth P point, this other paradigm, that maybe I'm not all that stuff. I don't, I don't have to worry about controlling those four P's. I'm not that stuff. They're going to come and go anyways. Uh, maybe within me, and this is the stuff that does belong to me, what, what's within me, the P, the point, the being? What's within me? Stuff will come and go, but maybe there are capacities and treasures within me that will stay intact even as things are changing, those other four Ps are changing. Does that make sense? My first exposure to what I later realized was spirituality. Some of you might be familiar with this, and many of you have already heard this, but it was an individual named Viktor Frankl who was in a concentration camp. And so he really had no control over the four Ps whatsoever, right? No control really, and the body was wasting away, the relations were going. <laughs> there was no status whatsoever. <laughs> and there was no possessions, really. The four Ps were gone. And within that context, internally, he was having this feeling, even then, I'm still responsible. I can still create quality of life even though those peas are pretty much gone. I can still create quality of life. But it's going to be internal. Something's going to happen inside. I can't look outside for that lightness or quality of life. We all know this, theoretically. Do we not? <laughs> but we're having problems living it. We know it theoretically, but we don't necessarily live it? And do we have another P, the patience to shift over? Because it's going to be a bit of a journey to shift over into this other way of living. You know, that's what all these festivals really represent, is an invitation to shift paradigms. Right? A celebration of a different way of living. And so this idea of, okay, if it's not about controlling the four Ps or getting my lightness and happiness from the four Ps. But actually, I have the capacity for lightness within me all the time. Do you think that's possible again in every situation? Do you believe in constant happiness? I can believe it. Intellectually, theoretically. <laughs> <laughs> I love honest people. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Theoretically, it sounds like it should work, right? But if I look at my life, you know, um, and in fact, we're in a part of the world where we have so much, so guess what? We're very disturbed by the smallest thing going wrong. Have you seen that? Very disturbed by the smallest thing. And then we wonder why we're not like why there's not this constant happiness. And then in other parts of the world where they seem to have almost nothing, right? They seem to have a better grasp on happiness and lightness. It's kind of embarrassing, actually. So, is there an internal capacity for lightness? And I love it when I see a candle, you know, because it's just this candle with a wick. I'm going, that candle has a capacity to be light. Does it not? I mean, it was built to be light. That's its nature, that's its purpose, that's its function, is to just be light. Yes? All it needs is a match, some source of light to illuminate it. And it's good to go, right? It's not that it suddenly turns into a candle, but it always is a candle. It always has that capacity. It just needs a source to light it. And it's good to go. 
Once it's lit, it doesn't even have a source anymore. It's just good to go. And it could be a source for others, absolutely. We might experiment with that tonight, yeah? So once that candle's lit, it could be a source to light another candle, great. So, I have a capacity, as a soul, I have a capacity, intern, an intrinsic capacity to be light. Doesn't matter what's going on out there, doesn't matter what's happening with the four bees. This body could be falling apart. And if I can access my intrinsic capacity to be light, I could stay light. Do you think that's possible? To stay light? Body's falling apart. Stay light, I lose my job. Stay light. Someone runs into my Maserati that's parked outside. I stay light. Is that possible? Not only is it possible, we can go a step further and start to care about other beings more than we do stuff, right? So if someone runs into my Maserati, I get angry at them rather than make sure they're okay. Because they're more important than my Maserati, are they not? The being is always more important than the stuff, right? Do we live that way? Honestly. Be honest. Do we really live that way? Does there ever come a point when stuff becomes more important than people. The temporary becomes more important than the eternal. If anyone works in business, they may have experienced how the bottom line becomes more important than people. Has anyone experienced that? It's called, uh... It stresses us out a lot because it's against our intrinsic nature. So really starting to remember our intrinsic nature is to be very light and to value that which is eternal, right? To really give that, really to protect the light of others. That's really our true nature. All we need to do, we have that capacity, so we just need to illuminate it or ignite it or, you know, kind of emerge it once again. And we're going to need a light source to do that, right? We often try and go to others to do it. But guess what? We're all in the same boat. Nobody's lit. <laughs> so, we can experiment with it right now. If I take one unlit candle and hold it to another unlit candle, what's going to happen? Nothing. But we do that, we do, and this is why we go kind of mad, is because we have that expectation, and someone said disappointment, we have that expectation. This is supposed to make me light. This is supposed to make me happy. I'm very disappointed it's not happening. But I'm kind of going in there like a crazy person, expecting something that could never happen. Because it's not lit, or they're not lit either. Right? We're all kind of roaming around looking for that light source. And so, when we look at spirituality, we can start to connect with that intrinsic capacity to be light and maybe even start to remember a source of light. And we kind of have a vague memory, but it's not a little twisted and distorted over time like a bad game of telephone. Have you ever played that game? Where you have a message and you whisper it and you whisper it and without every time I've played it it always has the same result. The message at the beginning and the message at the end is like, what happened? What happens? I never quite understand. It should be fairly straightforward. I take a message and I whisper it. And what happens? Why is it always distorted as it comes up the other side? Does anyone know? Perceptions, perceptions, yeah. There's all these biases in between, right? Our capacity to listen, to communicate, to understand is quite compromised. Right? So we kind of fill in gaps and do all sorts of other things as that message. And so we've done that. And so this memory we have, a source of light, has gotten extremely mixed up and twisted as it's gone through human communication. Not just human, but human doing communication, right? Very physical communication. And so how can I reconnect 
to that very pure understanding of the source of light, which, yes, we know of as God, the divine, or the supreme. There's a memory in each of us that's quite pure of that soul. It's got a lot of other weird, distorted ideas around it. And I remember in the Gita now, where Arjuna, you know, he was working on his ability to contemplate, to focus, and he always talk about the candle in the windless place. Have you heard that saying? A candle in a windless place. And what helps us a great deal to reconnect in a very clean and clear way with those memories is silence. Silence. I appreciate what was said about dawn, the beginning of the day. That is the most silent time of the day. I think you described it almost as a quiet joy. It's not dead. Silence is not dead. It's wonderful, but it's silent. It's quiet. It's very clean. It's very pure. There's not all that busyness and waste and noise going on. It's just the sound of those eternal memories. Silence. So if I want to connect with that source of light again, I'm going to have to develop a very powerful, enjoyable relationship with silence. Candle doesn't like a lot of wind. It doesn't go well. Right? It likes a windless place. Silence. So if you're open, I thought we could at this time um, go through a little bit of a meditation and then our concluding experience as well with the candles behind me to see if we can establish, re-establish ourselves, each of us in that state of being in a candle, going into that silence, and starting patiently to awaken that memory we each have of the source. Is that okay? A little contemplation? So it's going to require a little setup if we can be patient, <laughs> because we are going to have this commentary, this reflection, this remembering, and afterwards, we're going to invite each of you, one at a time, to, yes, celebrate, I suppose, but more remember through some symbolism. So there is these candles behind us. I think Diane's going to light the big white one. <laughs> and she'll be there with you. And invite each of you, in that state of awareness of being a candle, to light a candle but more as a mirror of who you are. So try not to get too caught up in the act of lighting the candle, more staying inside, connected to the experience of being alive, and just representing that externally by the light of the candle. And after that, coming around, watch you record, and we'll have for you here um, blessings and tolly as well, which you can take from here. So just a moment to set that up, if you and wait one or two minutes. Only in this space. Free to just focus on myself. No interest to look at anybody else. very aware that this is a precious moment and I rarely have. When I have permission to let go of all the roles and responsibilities, everything that's temporary, everything that tends to fill my mind in day-to-day -day life. I'm like an actor stepping off stage, out of the role, and stepping inside a sacred space inside. A sanctuary. A 
simple space, quiet. An atmosphere of gentleness. No pressure of time. A space where it feels my mind can relax. And the heart can open. A space where I remember I remember the intrinsic value of myself. I am innately and eternally a being of great worth. Not because of anything physical, not because of what I do, or have, or know. Just who I am. I see myself as a tiny candle in that sacred space. A tiny spark of light. Protected by pure feeling. I, the soul, the being, just lying. Just a nature of lightness. Absolutely free. Just pure being. <coughs> I the soul look out through these eyes, giving light. And when I dive into my own heart, I touch memories, the deepest memory, of my eternal connection to the Supreme Light.
is to protect the lightness of every soul. Bring every soul out of darkness into light. Bring humanity back into light. Create a world of pure light. of that one, the supreme giver of life. The one who can make me light again. This time, I light a physical candle. Oh. Um. 